26. We good? Good afternoon or early evening, however you like to look at it. I would like to call to order the October 26 regular meeting of Everett Public Schools Board of Directors. Tonight we have remotely Dr. Or <laughs> Director Nichols to read our land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish, Snohomish, and Tulalip peoples. We express our deepest respect and gratitude to the ancestors of this land on whose shoulders we stand. In Everett Public Schools, we strive to create equitable outcomes and build a culture of inclusive belonging for all students, teachers, staff, and community. Thank you. And thank you for joining us remotely. We appreciate you being here. Um, I did miss, this is a sort of a new thing for us. I wanted to read our closed caption disclaimer. Closed captioning is being provided by Zoom solely for the convenience of our viewers. Zoom closed captioning may not always transcribe accurately due to limitations of the machine generated service. Everett Public Schools does not review for accuracy and makes no representation or warranties regarding the accuracy, reliability, timeliness or completeness of any information that appears in a closed caption. And now will you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will the secretary please call the roll? President Mason. Present. Vice President Lassane. Present. Director Berg. Present. Director Mitchell. Present. Director Nichols. Present. Student Representative Colley. Present. Student Representative Pilch Besson. Present. Thank you. First item of business, as always, is the adoption of the agenda. Dr. Salzman, may you please provide an overview of tonight's agenda? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and to our public, good evening. Tonight's agenda contains the following, the superintendent's report, a segment for board comments, a segment for public comments, a segment for routine business, a segment for new business, and upcoming agenda items. Since publishing the agenda, the following change was made to the agenda. Item 7.01, the superintendent's report, the report was added, item 10.02. Approval of the personnel report. The report was updated, item 14.02. Replacement of ex expiring educational programs and operations levy. The presentation was updated, item 14.02. Replacement of expiring capital levy. The presentation was updated, item 15.01, upcoming meetings. The agenda item was updated. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda as amended. Is there any discussion? Hearing or seeing none, we will move to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The agenda is adopted. Item 6.0 of our agenda is recognitions, and tonight we do not have a recognition, so we will move ahead to the superintendent's report. Dr. Salzman. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and to the public. <clears throat> First, let me begin that on Friday, October 15th, all district employees participated in a fantastic Lid Day. It focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. It was an amazing day of making connections, learning, and planning for our district. And I would like to give a round of applause to Joy Odom Grant and team and to our entire cabinet and staff at this time. Thank you for making that happen. And do you want to know what's happening in Mrs. Hawkins' class at View Ridge Elementary? <laughs> they learn math and baking go hand in hand on their math baking day a great way to make learning fun as well as practical. And she had the most tweets of that week. So Mrs. Hawkins class, congratulations to you on making math fun. 
<laughs> I wanted to show you some good instruction being done at Woodside Elementary. Some third and fourth graders engaged in STEAM learning. Facilitated by teacher Lindsay Lippert, students problem solved and collaborated to build simple machines and develop beginner skills in coding. Great work to Woodside Elementary and to Madison Elementary for a STEAM program for our elementary students. Salutes and kudos to them. Mm. Saturday, we had a very special moment. Representing in the Ever Memorial Stadium, many, many bands came to our great city. And it was fantastic seeing the stadium fully crowded and excited. It was the Puget Sound Festival of Bands. And I would like to play a brief three minute clip of the Cascade High School's great performance. And if I might add to our public, I want to thank the Bamboos of Cascade, who, when I arrived in the afternoon, they just treated me so well, taking me all around and feeding me and showing me every angle of how great this event is. And uh, two years ago, before COVID, I sat next to Dr. Lancaster and watched her family and uh, present and what great musicians your family was. And then we had COVID. And then this year, I was with Mr. Fleckenstein as we watched the event and so proud of the city of Everett and how we welcome many families here and so proud of our students, so thank you. And then in closing to our youngsters, Sunday will be Halloween and I'm gonna ask you to be as safe as possible, okay? I know for many you're gonna be out and about, but please stay safe because we care about you, we love you, and we just want you to be as safe as you can on a day that I know many of you will be out and about, so thank you so much. Thank you. It was a great clip. Thank you for including that in your report. Okay, now we will go ahead and move to director and student representative comments. And um, I'm going to start with director Nichols, just so I don't forget him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have, <clears throat> excuse me, many comments uh, tonight. I'm sorry, I can't be there in person. I also missed uh, the instructional review today, um, just a little under the weather and uh, didn't want to expose any of our students, staff or faculty or uh, any other board members to this little bug I have. So um, I do want to say that um, 
I hope everybody has a great Halloween this weekend. And uh, as Dr. <laughs> Saltzman said, I hope you're all safe. Um, and then the, the second thing, um, I've had some parents contact me recently with, with issues, different things that are going on. Um, and I, I want to take this moment just to kind of set some expectations with our public uh, about communicating with the board. We, we love hearing from you. We always want to hear from you. Um, but know that we will always work with our administration. Um, it's never a top-down type of you bring me a problem and I'm going to make sure it's it's fixed. It's That's not how it works. We work collaboratively with our administration in the district. So I want to thank all of our parents that have contacted me um, and have started the process of working with their local school administration. And I hope that we can all work together to resolve any of these issues. And I have every confidence in our, our faculty and staff at Everett School District that they will do that. Uh, and that's all I got. Thank you. Director Lassane, you wanna? Uh, no comments right now, okay. thank you. Um, I sort of, um, this is gonna be difficult for me. Um, I want to thank the district for putting on, uh, I saw it on Twitter, but um, ADHD Awareness Month. Um, I am, do have permission to tell a very personal story um, that how ADHD, it goes underdiagnosed in women and girls. Um, I did send a review article to Kelly Clevenger because um, I would like to see if there's more that we can do for our women and girls. I have two young women in my family who both have um, were diagnosed this summer as adults with ADHD. Um, both of them were um, what we would, I think we would call um, neurodivergent, both highly capable students, both um, excellent students in school. Both of them underperformed probably what, what um, they were capable of. Both of them struggled, started struggling in middle school. And this review article does talk about when girls' hormones change is sometimes when the symptoms start to become um, worse. What girls are more likely to do per, per this review article and per my own knowledge is um, they do not act out in class. They hide their behaviors. They are really good at masking it when they hit middle school and as they continue to progress. This turned out for both of these girls and per this review article into anxiety, depression, eating disorders. And it was not until they sought treatment for these things that the ADHD was discovered. And then once they started getting treatment for the ADHD, they could, both of them look, told me they could look back at their lives and say, I know when this started. I know when I started to struggle. And this review article, I think, does a really good job of saying what we should do, that both of these girls, again, had good academic performance, both of them in college, out of college, in advanced degrees. It, it is not, girls are different from boys, and how can we look better at our girls? And um, so the fact that maybe if we can work with our medical pr um, practitioners when they are talking to our families, as a parent, they say, how's everything going at home? You say, it's fine. Are there more open-ended questions they could ask about how is the child at home? And then, um, so that they could identify those behaviors that are happening at home, maybe a light bulb goes on into the parent's mind that goes, oh my gosh, so they're, they aren't typical. All children don't do this. And maybe we can get those diagnoses earlier in our middle school. Who are these kids that are coming out of highly capable who are, who are not performing to what you think they should be performing, but are still good kids, they behave in class. So I'm just asking if Kelly can look at that and if we can really look at our girls because I hope, um, you know, uh, Director Nichols is much more knowledgeable about this than me. But if there's some way we can actually get to the cause of some of the anxiety and depression because they're internalizing this disorder because they, can, they can't name it, um, that maybe we can decrease some of the consequences that girls are, the, the girls are experiencing. The article does not say that it's only girls. It might be quiet boys. It might be other things. I'm not saying we shouldn't also look at our boys. Um, but this article does show, and I have personal knowledge, that girls go underdiagnosed. And as an adult, I think it is particularly harder for them to suddenly have this. So thank you for listening. And I've sent the article to Kelly. And I just really, I appreciate the Twitter message that if any parent, if anybody has a concern about ADHD to reach out to the school and reach out to your doctor, um, your child's doctor and really, really, really talk to them. So thank you. I know that was long. I want to close though really positively. I should not call out one student, but it is so much fun to watch Everett High School and Juju Williams. 
what an amazing young man, and I really hope that, that he, he gets what he wants in life. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for sharing your story. We appreciate it. Well, it's hard to follow. Sorry. Thank you for sharing. No, I just um, think, and I, so I don't, I don't know who Juju Williams is. Can I ask that question? Oh, he's one of the football players at Everett High, and he is fast. And um, the, his name is spoken every time because he's catching, he's receiving, he's running. He's just a standout on the field. All and right. Fun to watch. Well, thank you for that elaboration. <laughs> I think it helped myself and people at home. So thank you for that. I've been busy watching Jackson football, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, so um, that's <laughs> sorry, <laughs> so bad. So that said, I love all of our schools, all of our high school, all of our student athletes. One thing I want to highlight tonight is um, I'm a senior mom, and so I am super stressed out. And so I know our senior parents out there are probably super stressed out. We're getting to that time of year where we're looking at our high school and beyond plan, and we realize it says the word beyond. And I don't know why that all of a sudden jumps out this time of year, because it, we all focus on the high school, high school, high school. Now it's like, what next? That said, I just want to message to parents and guardians and folks helping these kids get to that beyond. Um, it's okay and it's different. Um, I'll tell you as a mother of six, I'm a number five applying for college and, um, and, and working on beyond. And it does look different than it did pre-COVID. And I'm saying that because there's a lot of parents out there who think that this is this is normal and, and it's just not, and it's okay. It's, it's fine and we're gonna get there and your kiddos are gonna be right where they should be at the end of senior year. But that said, ask questions, pay attention to emails, look at deadlines, reach out to your principal, or not, I shouldn't say principal, to your counselors, reach out to someone please don't let these things um, let things stress you out to the point of not asking questions I know even having um, kiddos in this situation some of them have waited a long time to ask me a question I'm thinking you know I, I know stuff about education they don't believe me but I do and and they wait and then I'm like oh my gosh there's a deadline and oh my gosh I've got to get this check-in and so I just really encourage the families out there you're not alone I'm right there with you we're all right there with you pulling for you I know our student directors are in the same same boat right now and so I'll let them tell, talk about their stories but that said just know that there is a beyond after high school and whatever choice your students making please reach out to someone at the district if you need help getting there because this is still abnormal times but we're going to make them a little more normal I guess I have uh, so, some pretty similar comments to make um, I am a senior this year and uh I have two older brothers, but neither of them went to a four year college after they graduated. So um, and my parents are from Toronto, where the system is very different. So it's a little bit of a first in my family. And uh, leading up to this year, I thought that I knew a lot more about that process than I did. So um, I kind of want to just turn this into a thank you for all of our school counselors, especially uh, the ones that specialize in, in college and applications and processes and things like that, because I get um, emails like every day from, um, I don't know the exact title, but the, I think it's the, the person that organizes the career center about college visits and about sessions where you can go and work on college applications. Um, my counselor has reached out to me individually a couple times with questions about my applications and like helping me make my deadlines and stuff like that. So um, I hope that other students have had the same experience. Um, like. As well as that, it's also been really stressful, but it's been nice to have that support. And I hope that other students have either had that same level of support or um, are aware that that level of support is available to them uh, if, uh, if they need it. Because, um, yeah, it's, I, I definitely thought that this would not be as complicated as it was. I thought the process was a little more straightforward and a little less arbitrary. Um, so, yeah, it's a difficult, Difficult time of year, but I'm getting through it. I have my first deadline on Monday, and then I'll have submitted an application. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't have much to say about college, <laughs> just because I'm a junior still. But um, <laughs> I do work with my AVID teacher a lot, though. The AVID teachers at our school are really great, and they help a lot, get like helping us get ready for college and applying early and all that stuff. But um, at Cascade, some things that are like going on, we're starting new clubs, we're starting drama club, math club, clubs around the language building, like German, Chinese, Spanish, 
and um, STEM club as well. And we did have our bottle for Broadway game last Friday, which sadly we did lose, but <laughs> it was still a fun game. And um, we also did get to see the band perform their, um, their festival routine a little bit at halftime. They didn't do the whole thing with the smoke. That was a lot cooler, but <laughs> they showed a little bit of it and it was fun to watch. Thank you. Thank you all for comments. I, I don't have much to say. I guess I would just echo um, Director Nichols' comments. Um, given that um, my seat is up for election this year, um, one of the benefits of that is the um, by default, you get an opportunity to talk to a lot more parents because more people reach out, which I really appreciate um, because it does give us an opportunity to um, help clarify or answer questions. Um, you know, there's a lot of information out there, and I think the district does an amazing job of of keeping our public informed, but there's just a lot of details that um, people don't know. And so it's it's great to have that opportunity to have those one on one conversations and clarify things and answer questions. Um, and sometimes, you know, we involve other people to help us solve problems. Um, but um, and we can clarify that <laughs> mask mandates were state mandated, <laughs> not <laughs> district mandated. So anyhow, um, thank you all for your comments tonight. Appreciate it. OK, we are on to the consent agenda. Dr. Salzman, may you please provide. Oh, did I do? Oh, thank you. I scrolled too far on my computer screen. Um, we are actually on to public comments. And do we have any public comments tonight? OK, thank you. And thank you for backing me up. Now we are on to our consent agenda. And I have Dr. Salzman introduce it. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors, and the public. The board's consent agenda includes repetitive business items such as meeting minutes, personnel actions, expense vouchers, surplus lists, gifts, grants, and recurring contracts. Sometimes includes items that occur less frequently but are of routine business nature. These items are usually reviewed by the board in the Friday report, one or more weeks before the board meeting. This gives directors time to ask staff questions or to consider discussion about the policy implications of those items. The board votes on the consent agenda in a single motion. By its definition, a consent agenda is not debatable. In the case of this consent agenda, the superintendent's office received no questions regarding items on the consent agenda. The consent agenda is presented as published for board approval. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. There a second? Not online. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it has been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Would any director like to remove an item from the consent agenda and place it in the new business section of the agenda? Hearing no requests, we will go ahead and move to a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. And the consent agenda is approved. Next item of business is 11.0 strategic progress monitoring and tonight we do not have a strategic progress monitoring item. So we will go ahead and move to information and discussion. And we do not have an information and discussion topic tonight, which takes us to unfinished business and we do not have an unfinished business item tonight. So we are going to move on to new business for 14.01. <coughs> Replacement of expiring educational program and operations levy. And Mr. Moore is going to walk us through that. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Dr. Salzman, Board of Directors. I'm happy to be here tonight to talk about something that is fairly routine to us. However, it's only fairly routine to us every four years. So I'm gonna share this document. Make sure, Director Nichols, can you see that okay? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. And I, I just want to recap my words that I just spoke a few moments ago. 295 school districts in the state and our state funding restructure relies upon local voter voted in uh, levies. Over the years, it used to be called maintenance and operations levy. Really, the title, as districts found, didn't accurately describe what this 
actual funding is doing because it's more than just maintenance and operations it's about funding the core instructional programs and enrichment programs that we have more recently we've called it the educational programs and operations levy the state would call it uh, in the rcw's and enrichment levy tonight i'm going to go over what is an ordinary event every four years but it is extraordinary in terms of the complexity of what it takes to design and put before our voters a proposal that will meet the needs for the next five years. So we're gonna talk a little bit about local, local property tax support. I'm gonna talk again, we have to link it back to the McCleary. Um, we have to remind our legislators and constituents that the levy formula created out of McCleary is still somewhat inequitable and also remind ourselves of what we've done over the last several years to build reserves to offset uh, the depth of the levy cut, but also to offset the, the phase out of regionalization, which means our salaries have been uh, set at a flat rate for the last two or three years. Finally, I'm gonna talk about what uh, the, the basis is for the amount set for the levy going forward, and then uh, just briefly comment on what the Fiscal Advisory Council reviewed um, so, excuse me, yes. So as we know, there are three different funding components locally for this district and for most districts in the Puget Sound area. There's the educational programs and operations levy requiring a 50% uh, simple majority plus one. Uh, building and technology capital levy, which Mr. Gunn is gonna follow with a presentation on that proposal occurring on the same date in February. And finally, capital construction bonds requiring a 60% supermajority. Just to remind our, our, our public that there are some districts that also have transportation vehicle fund levies. We have not done so um, in the last 20 or more years, to, uh, just as a reminder. So what does the levy fund? I think you would, as you know, but our, our constituents need to know that it really is intended to fund enrichment. It's intended to fund um, additional activities and programs that support our students above the basic education program. But we also know that the basic education funding does not cover all of the costs associated with that. So while um, there is great, um, uh, there's just great um, opportunities to invest in clubs and sports and all the different program offerings, extended days, early learnings, orchestra, uh, marching band, some of the things we talked about, family partnerships, but we're also putting a lot of investments into our guidance counselors, our mental health supports, um, staff mentors, a lot of the programs we do just to enrich the performance of our staff, including professional development. But there still are those major, er major areas that are underfunded by the state, and special education is one of the largest ones at about 9 million, student transportation at about 1.2, and safety and security is also significantly underfunded. So we know that over time, um, we look to the state, as I'm going to mention, or I'll mention that in a moment. Excuse me, I got ahead of myself. So the, the challenge of predicting and looking into the future is that here it is October 2021, and we have to predict what may occur in collection years 2023 through 2026. And it's a one-time estimate that once the voters approve that level, it is set. You cannot accomplish or you cannot uh, run a second operational levy. So generally, we look for favorable conditions. We know it will always be governed by the state funding formula, but we do build in typically favorable um, estimates of enrollment, uh, the CPI, com com computer Consumer Price Index, it used to be assessed property values for us, but that's not as much of a factor these days. It is for some school district because our formula is based upon the number of students we have based upon the dollar amount, and I'll talk about that in a sec. So the big bullet here is the potential legislative outcomes. And if we were to walk back four years, we would know that we had to predict what we felt the legislature may do in the next several sessions because this this particular measure will be locked in place through 2026 as two biennial sessions. So that is a big part of the presentation tonight, just to be overt that we are anticipating that the legislature will provide some sort of um, relief to the low levy cap that was set as a result of McCleary. 
Here's just a snapshot. If you were to look at our budget revenues now and you were to say how much, what percentage of our revenues are provided by local taxes in the current year budget, you would say it's 13.7%. And how much is covered by the state when you add up state general purpose and state special purposes, it's 71%. If you were to go back just before the levy swap occurred, you would find that the levy was at 18.9%. <clears throat> so the levy is a percentage of revenues has dropped by 5.2%, but the state revenues have only increased by 0.3%. And you would, you would see that over time, the levy contributions, I, if you went back to 2011, 12, you'd see that the levy covered 23%. So uh, large districts in the Puget Sound area in particular still believe that the levy swap cut our local levies too much. So as I mentioned a minute ago, there's two ways that districts um, are capped. One is it's the lesser of these two formulas. It's the lesser of $2.50 per 1,000 assessed value. And you can see the districts generally more rural that are, are capped by that. Or it's a student, FTEs, full-time student FTE times a dollar amount. And for Everett and all other districts, uh, it is $2,663 for the 2002 year. But for one district, Seattle, it's $3,196. We consider ourselves to be an urban district facing the same labor costs, the same um, higher cost of living, and the same uh, urban impacts as Seattle. And so, this particular levy is intended to assume that at a minimum or one of the viable solutions is to allow other larger urban districts to seek the same per pupil uh, assessment as as Seattle. This particular slide is a snapshot. This is going back in time. We have talked for a number of years about how to manage ourselves through the regionalization phase out and how to sustain our programs up until we have at least a 2023 um, uh, educational programs and operations levy. And the reason is, is we were coming to a more or less a why in the road. By that point in time, either we will look to the legislature to fully fund some of those elements such as spe special education, such as transportation, or we will need to rely upon our voters for our local level of support to sustain that, or we'll have to make significant reductions. So I guess that's a fork in the road, not a Y in the road. So facing that, um, this is sort of a walk through time. So this is back um, just before the levy swap occurred. And if you look at this diagram, I will tell you this is very complex and I'm going to slow down a little bit so I make sure I tell the story accurately that this is intended to communicate. During McCleary, and if you went back to 2014 when we ran an operations levy, we know that there was a levy cliff pending somewhere around 2018. And we estimated what we thought the economy would do in terms of a, of, of a levy increase, but we were also trying to pass a bond. So that's the pressure to keep your levy rate low um, and so that you can have the capacity and try to honor that stable tax rate. What really occurred, though, is that the economy did recover and McCleary, there was responses. And so what our state formula allowed was a much higher level of collection. So in this example, 18 months before that four year window, we underestimated what the state would allow for local collections. Allowing it doesn't mean we necessarily have to, but in this circumstance, we had underestimated what um, our local voters could support. This is what happened after McCleary. If you were to look at the way that the levy was tracking, that number was clearly the reason that the state was found unconstitutional for um, relying too much on local levies. This seems deceptive, but look, the bottom line is 30 million. So know that this is just to capture the information in a smaller scale, but that was a significant drop, 50% of our levy. We had anticipated it, and so when we went out at this point in time in 2018, we anticipated that, one, uh, we knew that there, it was too late for local collections to exceed that, so we set the number low that year. 
And then if you recall, we had anticipated that with regionalization phasing out, we would move to, towards and slowly increase what we thought the legislature would occur. Had we not done so, we would have been capped down here in this range, and we would not have been able to sustain the programs we've had for these last two years. It was also at that point in time when the legislature had invested a number of dollars that helped us build the fund balance to sustain during this period of time. So that decision 18 months before to create the capacity is the same decision that's being proposed here today. So if we go to today, we are on the verge of a 2022 levy. We need to ask, <laughs> estimate what could occur over the next several months because this particular area is, we're sort of reaching that juncture. We don't anticipate in this short session that the legislature will add investments, <laughs> but in the future, one or the other needs to occur for us to sustain the programs we are at the level we have today. And so by setting our cap under this model at this level, which is the Seattle per pupil funding, we're giving ourselves the local ability to have that rate set high enough that whatever the formula with the state does, we can adapt to it. If we were to set the formula that, that high, and it's not significantly high, it, but if we were to um, establish a higher cap in the legislature were to fulfill and provide significant funds, it's each year when we adopt our budget is when we actually set the assessment. So this is designed to be um, supportive of our, our direction going forward and provide us the local ability for the next five years to access the resources from our local voters to support the programs that they're so used to and accustomed to. This is, uh, and Mr. Gunn in a few moments is gonna show you a similar version. This is sort of a, a, as you can see, a numerical graph of what our levy rates are going forward. And you can see, I mentioned that $2.50 per um, per uh, 1,000 AV. We're actually at these rates, $2.20, 215, 214, and 214 at the Seattle rate. And these are the fixed dollar amounts, keeping in mind that once we as apply that assessed value, the AV rate doesn't matter. These are locked in dollar caps for the next four years that our voters would be considering in February. Looking at sort of this diagram, which we've seen over the years, it tells it also tells a pretty significant story. <clears throat> Going back, if you recall in 2000 and, uh, in 2014, we had had a bond proposal that would have maintained a stable tax rate at around 598. We did not pass the bond and so our tax rate fell and it was in 2016 that we asked our voters to approve and thankfully so the capital technology levy and building improvements levy which really funded the one-to-one -one program that we're benefiting from today particularly during COVID. But at that point in time we asked for a 68 cent per 1000 AV increase, 68 cents in this period of time. And as we went through time, we are anticipating, as you know, in 2020, right when COVID hit, to again sustain that stable tax rate with a bond measure, which unfortunately we did not have enough votes um, to put it across the line. So once again, our rate, as you can see, this blue schedule, our current bond debt is diminishing significantly. In fact, starting in 2023, the only debt is from that 2016 levy. But right at this point in time, we're looking at an 84 cent increase to try to reestablish um, a, a viable capital investment in our structures, which Mr. Gunn will talk about you shortly. So with that, I, you're gonna hear a lot of more about this particular part of our diagram from Mr. Gunn. I'm done with the actual presentation and would welcome any questions. Oh, excuse me. I need to honor our fiscal advisory council, which also had reviewed this proposal. And our conversation really kind of went directly to the fact that we need to continue to address our state funding shortfalls and planning for what the legislature may do with lever reform is good stewardship. But the challenge is the complexity of this particular presentation, it doesn't set well with the public and we have to figure out a way to simplify the message so they can understand kind of the big picture over a period of time. And one of the most important ways to do that is to make them really understand how important these investments are for students. It's not maintenance and operations, it's educational programs. It's really about educational programs. So that's that's my presentation for tonight. I'd welcome any questions. 
Thank you. It's a little complex. I have several questions, but I'm going to turn it over to directors first. Who do have... do Nichols first, just in case? <coughs> Pardon? Do you want to do Director Nichols? Um, go ahead, Tracy, if you have questions. Oh, okay. Um, I just have yeah. one just clarifying question, just because of house values going up. Um, so that pure so, dollar... Oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Can you take this slide down just oh. so we can... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but just to clarify that set dollar amount, even if house AVs go up, we can only collect a set dollar amount. So it's it's that the, the, my tax rate will go down as my house value goes up. So I'll pay the same amount. Is that how does can you just explain how that pricing works as our houses keep appreciating so greatly? Because, because I think there is a fear of lots of us that our taxes are going to go up. But so, it's not a clear <clears throat> linear relationship. Well, as I mentioned, the overall tax rate of which the EPO levy is a large portion of it is going to apply a larger rate. So that 84 cents is sort of the step back into the stable tax rate, tax rate range we used to, we used to try to strive to maintain. Um, <clears throat> of that 84%, probably more than half for sure is, is the educational programs levy. Oh, no, no, I mean like the, but I'm talking about so, the, so the set in, dollar yeah, amount. So that, in the that, out, out that years, 69 million when, or whatever. When, in the outer okay. years, uh, when we apply those dollar amounts, they are assessed to the pool of property owners. And if your values go up and there's no additional construction, um, then your rate would likely go go down because it's a set dollar amount distributed. It's still distributed amongst all those same taxpayers. In that year, there are more people contributing though, right? And that, I'm sorry, it would be stable, but there are more people contributing during that period of time because there's new construction around mm -hmm. us, the, the tax values go up. Mm -hmm. So rather than, you know, the number of pieces of pie begin to increase. Okay. I think the perception that this would increase your taxes, it will, it's sort of inherently built to grow just slightly, like 3% mm -hmm. a year, because mm -hmm. that's what the cost of construction is. Mm -hmm. So you can't say no, that you can do this without your tax rate increases. Mm -hmm. But relative to other forms of taxes that are based upon our rate, um, it would main, remain constant based upon the number of people contributing. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to clarify, so with the resolution that we're asking for, is this asking to go higher than the state current levy rate? And just, just specifically how much, like the resolution's asking for this and what's the cap currently? The cap, if you recall, when it was voted in um, was 2,500 for all districts except Seattle, which was 3,000 per student. And since that time, it's only increased by CPI. So CPI since that point in time takes Everett to 1,660 and Seattle to 3,133. But the problem with the state formula is that three elements contribute to it. One is our salary increases are only funded by the state at IPD, which is lower than CPI. The revenue from the state grows at CPI on what we can collect from our local voters. And the gap is only about 0.3%. And yet, um, we know that with a major increase in labor costs and uh, us setting our um, employees at a, as a, at a mark rate schedule continues to exceed that 0.3%. So there's two ways of looking at that cap is that in the long run, the formula needs to be fixed to, to, to account for the ability for us to work locally on the initiatives and programs, but also to keep rate pace with those local costs. So yes, I will say that right now, the local levy was that bottom line, the local um, dollar amount for Everett that is currently in statute is is it that 20, 1668, whereas we're setting it a bit higher to see whatever maybe adjustments may occur in the next five years. So to your point about simplicity of message, um, so I'm like, I just, I'm just trying to figure out. That's a really good point I should be mentioning. So I'm just, well, no, and I love the information because it's good information, but I'm just trying to figure out 
the cap is X. I just want, I just want just for the public, like so just the two numbers, right? So the state cap is X and what we're asking for is Y. What I'm just trying to figure out what those two numbers are. Relative to today. Yeah, like in 2021, 22. In terms of what we're, I'm assuming voting on in a resolution. Right, the, the cap, the current cap is at 20, 20, is it 1,663? And we're asking for it to go to... I'm sorry, 2,663. Okay. And we're asking for it to go to 3,100. So 2,600 to 3,100. Yeah. Okay. And then just out of curiosity, um, do we have, met, like, because I understand the labor and everything is going up in price, but I know as a district, we've always talked about um, Everett having um, a certain uh, median household income, which is fairly low, if I remember right, in terms of county. And then, of course, as we go further south, it gets a little bit higher. But do we know how many of our staff actually live in district, like in terms of being able to compare that apples to apples? And you don't need that. I mean, if you don't have it now, that's fine. I'm just wondering, maybe in a Friday report, I just it would be good to know the percentage of staff that we're talking about, because we're talking about regionalization and, you know, do our staff live in our district and with and, and I don't want to misquote, but I believe I heard the median household income for Everett is like the second lowest in the county for the city of Everett. Um, and I know our district encompasses way more than the city, but I just want to make sure we're getting an understanding of where staff is living. Yes, we can provide that information to that you, the great. number of staff that live within the district. Within the district boundaries, yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. and, and I, so, I believe some of that medium income was in Mr. Gunn's uh, attachments to some prior yeah. presentation where he's talking about the total tax rate and how it affects the different pricing levels. Can I ask this clarifying question just really quick based on her question? Um, so that we're going to ask for that Seattle rate, we can legally collect this rate based on what we know right now. So unless legislature changes, the assessor will only pull Correct. what we're allowed to do. But we're asking uh, voters to sort of give us the a little bit more in case the legislature changed, we can Correct. go up to there. But we but we cannot collect more than we can legally collect Correct. today. Correct. Thank you. Um, just a point of clarification. Are we voting on that resolution tonight? Or is no. this, okay, so this is just for information. And this then is come the back. first reading, yes. That's perfect. Thank you. Director Nichols or Lesane? I did have uh, one main question, and uh, it's basically so what I understand the categories that we're funding, but do we have actual dollar amounts that are saying we need to fund this program at this level? so on and so forth that we're using this levy for we are yes yes we do we are in the process of developing a breakdown and we can provide that to the board um, i do not have it here at this meeting tonight it's a part of a um, a, a submittal to the to the office of superintendent of public instruction so yes we can provide that to you um, because I think as, as far as messaging goes, this is the important thing, right? Just like yeah. with the capital levy, um, your tax dollars are buying us, your our children, this, you know, a new school, uh, better security at this place, whatever it may be. Um, I'm not seeing that here with this. I understand the importance of the of the EP&O levy. Um, but right now, as it's presented, it, it looks just kind of like a blank check that the community is writing to us to just spend on any of these types of programs. Um, and I, I just want to be real intentional with what we're, you know, doing and asking and, and all that. Absolutely. We can provide, provide it to you by the end of the week. Thank you. No questions. No questions. Okay. I had, I had a couple questions on a couple of the different slides. So starting with slide six, um, you talk about, I, I guess, the simple question is, what what was the change in percentage of both the state general purpose and state special purpose funding uh, pre and post McCleary? Because you know you talk about the change in the levy, which went from it was a cut of five point two, right? But you don't talk about the change in the the state funding, which you so know they. They did infuse some money there. They did. Just talk about the twenty one twenty two, and I'm just curious. So the what that offset was, if you if you know that or not. I do, I do. 
Uh, 2011, 12. Wait, uh, that's when it, was McCleary resolved? It wasn't McCleary that McCleary was early. resolved in uh, 2018. Okay, so so during McCleary, you talk about the state influxing funds, and so you can see the effect because like from the difference of 1718 to 2021, or right, 17 and 18 was uh, the state was 8.9 percent, and this was the example in the slide. Actually, it was 1718 compared to today. But I think it's important to go back and say during the McCleary um, transition where the legislature had made a, a spending plan and increased funding, the levy went from 23% to 22% to 21% down to that 18.9. The state contribution at the beginning of the influx of McCleary was 63%, then 64%, then 66%. So between 2011 and 12, the state contribution increased from 63% to 71%. And our levy decreased from 23% to 18.9%. And I can provide you a summary of this also this week. So then you flash forward to today and that 18.9% dropped to the 13.7% in the slide. And the 1819, the state contribution increased from 71% to 71.3% of revenues. And so you, you, I assume, have the dollar amounts associated with those percentages, because that's probably almost easier to look at, because once you increase one percentage, the other one's obviously going to switch. And it, so I'm trying to get an understanding of what the absolute dollar value of the state funding you know increased over the years right versus the absolute dollar of the decrease of our levy um, right just because percentages are kind of a weird wonky way for me to sort of understand it because and, once and, you change one it all changes and we don't want to um the outcome of mccleary was significant the the investments that were made in in full day kindergarten in k3 class size in a number of areas were a great contribution to public education. And the resources associated with that um, came with the expenditures we needed to um, right. offset them. So what you're gonna see during that time is public schools are getting a lot more funding, including the investment in salaries to bring everybody to market rate. <laughs> what we're talking about here is simply that we don't need a significantly larger levy but they need to either finish the job or we need access to funding or we contract on right. the program. And, and so much of what the state did provide and increased was was very much needed, but it was money that had to go into specific programs. And yes. whereas this local funding allows us to offer things like summer school and after school programs and things that Correct. the state probably will never fund. Correct. And then you build in ESER, we're, we're, we're providing additional supports through ESER that are only limited by time. So, you know, if, if we have the ability to use local funds to add those supports in the future, that will continue to benefit, benefit our kids. So I have two things I need to get for you. One is I'll get you the breakdown, uh, Director Nichols, of what the levy uh, is funding and then also I think that would be helpful for directors you know to sure. offer some talking points too okay. and then on the um looking at slide 10 um I think it was slide 10 those rates would actually the the rates that we're looking at that you're providing there are for the Seattle levy or the yes. legal uh, okay yes, the, the Seattle rest, dollar yes. amount yes. okay thank you and so those those rates would decrease um, if there were no legislative changes. Correct. Okay. And then um, just By last. About, 20, about 24 cents. Yeah. My only final comment is um, you have outdone yourself on slide nine. <laughs> That's <laughs> one that yeah. I have been looking at levies for a long time and um, it's pretty complex. I'm not sure what to make of that one. <laughs> so, one follow-up yeah. question, if I may. Um, what is the student size in, in Seattle? What What's their student population size? I think they're around 50,000 students. 50,000 students, okay. And are they, Seattle, the only district who is using the uh, cap, levy cap at 
3196 yes no other district y yes that is correct it's, it's hard to hear you sorry. oh sorry the Thank threshold you. in the statute was based upon districts over i think it's 40,000 which really there's only one the line there's only one <laughs> there's only one even spokane uh, no no Tuc spokane tacoma, tacoma no nope. and actually lake washington is getting to it's be one of the biggest one too so yes mm -hmm. i see thank you very much i appreciate mm -hmm. it thank you any further questions uh I yeah actually, Tara, please yeah i had a question um so if i'm understanding especially slide nine and well I don't know if I'm understanding that one, but slide 10 um, and slide 11 especially. Um, so the the process of having the proposed capital levy and the EPO levy is to sort of counteract both the McCleary uh, offset and also the fact that our bond had not passed in the past. So I'm wondering about, because um, you spoke a little bit to the McCleary funding and how that's too uh, directly targeted at certain programs. Um, I'm curious about how the proposed capital levy and the EPO levy can um, offset some of the proposed things that we had wanted to do some spending on from the bond that hadn't passed, um, and if that funding can sort of fill some of those same gaps that from that, uh, or if it has to be directed in a different way um, by nature of it being a levy and not a bond. Um, if you could clarify, I would I would ask you to. Hold that thought because Mr. Gunn will okay. <laughs> remedy that question. But it's a really good question. Okay, it looks okay. like we have no further questions. Thank you so much for the overview. Appreciate it. At this time, we will go ahead and move to our next new business item, which is the replacement of expiring capital levy. And Mr. Gunn is going to take us through this one. All right, is that showing up on the um, on the um, virtual screen for you? Yes. Yes, okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, and we'll come to your question here um, in due course, I'm sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moore, for your um, introduction to the capital levy agenda item. I'd also like to welcome two members of our capital bond planning committee, uh, Shelley Henderson and Justin Tidwell. I will invite them to come up here a little bit later and make some comments to you. We also have some members of the committee joining us by Zoom, including Jim Dugan, the facilitator um, of the process from Parametrics. He has helped us on a number of uh, strategic issues over the last three or four years, and we're thrilled that he was able to help us uh, with this as well. So um, as an overview, we're going to present a recommendation to you from the Capital Bond Planning Committee for a um, capital levy in February of uh, 2022, along with draft resolution 1268, kind of a companion piece to the uh, EPNO levy that you just heard about from Mr. Moore. Um, the um, Capital Bond Planning Committee was established in 2018 to develop a recommendation for a 2020 capital bond, which it did so. Uh, the capital bond was put in front of the voters and uh, did not receive the uh, necessary level of approval to pass as a bond. Um, we recently asked them to reconvene and to put some thought into developing a recommendation for a capital levy in February of 2022. Um, so they, uh, about half of the members of the uh, Capital Bond Planning Committee agreed to come back, and um, they came back and met on September 13th and the 27th to accomplish this task. Um, so once again, this is what we'll recommend to you tonight. I did want to make some comments, though, um, just real quickly. Uh, this is a replacement of the expiring capital levy. We passed a uh, capital levy in 2010. Six years later, it's a six-year levy. Six years later, in 2016, we 
passed it again. So here we are six years after that for another replacement capital levy. Um, we have brought a considerable amount of information to you over time regarding capital bonds and levies uh, for the last six years or so, fairly uh, steady stream of information. More recent, or most recently at your August workshop, we brought to you uh, four possible options for a February 22 capital levy, uh, along with the tax rates that would be associated with, with those options. Um, when we uh, contacted the Capital Bond Planning Committee, we provided them the same information that we provided to you. Uh, and we also tempered that with some, um, some of kind of the, I guess, uh, baseline assumptions that, that we were gathering from the board during that time. So we shared that with them as well. Um, and that is that the, um, the, that there would very likely in this scenario uh, for a large capital levy, we would not be running a capital bond for at least the duration of the capital levy. So for at least six years, possibly longer. Um, I, we also shared with them that the $4.08 per thousand dollars of assessed valuation that Mr. Moore just showed you in a couple different slides. We'll have the same slides come up here in just a few minutes. But those that $4.08 per thousand dollars of assessed valuation, that tax rate includes the, uh, the entire capital levy that we're proposing tonight, as well as the entire um, EPNO levy that Mr. Moore presented tonight. So the $4.08 is for everything. Um, the uh, work that the Capital Bond Planning Committee did was based on the um, package that the that they recommended in for the 2020 capital bond. That was kind of the baseline where they started. Um, we provided again all the information we provided to you plus more, and then we had some conversations with the Capital Bond Planning Committee. They asked questions. We provided some answers. Um, and then they engaged in discussions regarding the district's needs, some of the current facility conditions, uh, tax rate implications, and um, the assumptions that we provided them based on our conversations with you. Um, during the conversation, some of the rationale that the committee members expressed uh, as they deliberated and came up with their um, recommendation. They were concerned about increasing property taxes and balancing that with the need to maintain facilities and technology. The work that they did two years prior to develop a list of projects for a capital bond, uh, those needs did not go away just because the um, levy or the bond did not was not successful two years earlier. So the needs are still there. Some of them have changed. We've dealt with the highest critical ones. Uh, and adjusted the pricing of some of those. And over the last two years, learned about some other needs that we have. So those were included. Um, the committee wanted to include projects that enhance safety and security, especially during our COVID experience that we learned so much about across the district. Also, the recent en enrollment declines, we shared that information with the committee. And that kind of, kind of helped them um, understand that maybe this is not the time to consider uh, those 36 elementary school uh, additions, classroom additions that, that we had on the bond. And then they also um, got in and, and made some adjustments to the list of projects, thinking that maybe the community would not fully understand the need for um, softball field drainage improvements, for example, and some parking lot expansions. Um, I will say that uh, driving this kind of the whole process through two of us, the idea of trying to reduce the price as much as possible, just so that the uh, you balance the, the need versus the cost. So that was kind of a overview of that. So now I'm gonna go through the list of projects that is on the recommendation. So um, replacement of two elementary schools is on the recommendation, Madison Elementary and Jackson Elementary School. You see the price uh, that we have in there for Madison is uh, quite a bit more than Jackson is two reasons. It's a larger school and the site is about twice as big. Um, it has about 14,000 square feet more in building area. So that's kind of explains the difference, but they're full replacements and uh, building new buildings 
and then tearing down the old buildings and redoing the site. Um, we have some high school upgrades and modernizations that replace entirely the Cascade High School Science Building. This would allow for uh, STEM focused, uh, the aerospace and advanced manufacturing career connected pathway for that school. It would also um, take the place of the auto shop that's already there. Um, not physically, we would basically use the space that the auto, the um, trying to think of how to put it. We would replicate that space in the science building, in the new building. Um, and we would do that to get some state funding that then would, um, we would be able to use to expand that science building. Uh, also upgrade two science classrooms at Jackson High School, again for STEM, and also to allow us to continue to meet the science um, graduation requirements at that school. Modernized classrooms and cafeteria at the Everett High School Civic Auditorium building. This is the cafeteria, kitchen, classrooms surrounding the Civic Auditorium. Um, it would also the, replace the, uh, that tunnel ramp that goes up on the southeast corner of the building um, and do a full modernization of that building. Also, some, up, some upgrades to the cafeteria and kitchen at Cascade, um, at Cascade High School. This um, recommendation also includes the standard kind of baseline projects, HVAC roofing and flooring systems, uh, HVAC controls at four sites, roofing at six schools, and I have the list of those if uh, you would like. Uh, they're also attached to the uh, board docs system. Um, replace flooring at uh, Emerson and Emerson Elementary and Silver Firs Elementary. Improve safety and security, uh, installing some fencing at Everett High and Cascade. At Everett High, it would be on the uh, north side of the main building connecting to the little theater, and it would be to keep, primarily to keep uh, school day tra uh, pedestrian traffic from transiting the site during the school day. That's, that's the intention there. At Cascade, it would, it would be fairly similar. The idea is to put enough uh, kind of ornamental wrought iron fencing up that looks nice, but it keeps our sites more secure at those high schools. Um, upgrading our security systems at 11 locations. Access control systems at Everett High and Cascade. These are the systems that require um, a badge to open up the doors. So those two schools are the two schools we have not done yet. Um, also, it would it put the video monitoring systems at the schools. Uh, replace lock sets and keying systems district-wide. Fire alarm upgrades at Mill Creek Elementary, Silver Firs, and Everett High School Science Building. Um, it would replace aging playground equipment at eight elementaries, new reader boards at 19 schools, electronic reader boards, uh, replace freezers and coolers at Jackson and Cascade High Schools. Bleachers at Jackson and Cascade High Schools also. Those two schools are getting to the point where major systems are starting to wear out, so we're helping extend their life. The Clean Buildings Act was a state uh, <coughs> legislature passed requirement in 2019, applies to buildings over 50,000 square feet. Any uh, owner of a building over that size throughout the state has to do certain upgrades. Um, and it, I, it's, if they don't, then they're hit with substantial fines if they don't do that. Um, and then also technology systems, equipment, and services. This is the uh, maintenance or the continuation, the support of that technology investment that the owners approved in 2016 that allowed us to weather the COVID experience from a technology standpoint so well. Um, it allowed us to achieve the one-to-one -one student to uh, device ratio. This investment here of 96 million will allow us to continue to do that for the next six years. That's it in a nutshell. It also does uh, upgrades to the infrastructure, hotspots out in the community. Um, it provides professional development facilitators to uh, help us understand how to use those systems and um, a lot of other things. But that's, that's the, uh, that's a summary of the recommendation. There were some projects from the original big list of the uh, projects that were on the 2020 bond recommendation that did not make it on this recommendation. Um, 
So 36 new elementary school classrooms did not make it on the recommendation. I've mentioned that. Also, Lowell Elementary did not make it on. And the $63 million uh, price tag, I think the um, committee was really just trying to find a way to balance the cost versus the benefit of this. Of those three elementary schools, Madison, Jackson, and Lowell, our staff did a study of the um, systems and the buildings and the, um, the ADA compliance and just everything that it would take and determined that Madison and Jackson were higher priority than Lowell. Um, it's not to say that Lowell has a low priority, it's just it didn't have a, as high a priority as those other two. Um, the Everett High School vocational building was left off of the recommendation. We've already put about $4 million in the last three or four years into that building to allow it to accommodate the, um, or to provide the health um, science um, medical pathways connection in, for STEM at that building. This um, investment of $11.8 million would allow us to um, fully modernize the remainder of the building, which we still need to do, but for the time being, that building can provide that pathway, that STEM-connected pathway at that site. Um, and then also the uh, interior and exterior finishes at Everett High, that, that was just finishes. We can, the building will last for, an, you know, a few more years while we get other investments to, uh, to, to do that, those finishes. Then the parking lots at Emerson and Jefferson were left off. They're necessary, but the committee was, that along with the uh, softball field upgrades, um, I think those were the projects that the committee members were thinking that there may not be some recognition in our community that they were a high priority. So with that, um, I'll go to this, it was a very similar slide that Mr. Moore showed. Uh, it does have two more years added onto it on the far right-hand side of this spreadsheet, and that is because the capital levy goes for two more years beyond the EP&O levy. So we've had to indicate by that red cloud there with the uh, pending future EP&O levy, we're assuming that the tax rate would continue for the EP&O levy beyond the um, four years that we're going for right now. So what, what I'll point out to you is that the uh, capital levy rate all by itself jumps up, especially in uh, 2024, from what it used to be, at the same time that the capital bond debt rate goes down. So if you add those two, the capital levy and the, ca and the bond debt, you will see that um, it's very comparable to what it was uh, in about 2020 and before. So the last two years, you've seen a drop in the tax rates what we're proposing here, and you'll see it on the next slide too, is going down the road for the next six years, we're proposing that the tax rates would be very close to what they were about two years ago, even though they're going to be seen as, a, um, and they are in fact, an increase over what's happened in the last two years. I'll show you that again right now. So in 2021 and 2022, those rates dropped primarily because we're paying off bonds. When you don't pass bonds, your tax rate's gonna go down. So what we're proposing in 2023 is a $4.08 total combined tax rates for both levies, which is actually lower than the tax rate was in 2020 and years prior to that. So again, I just wanted to kind of point that out. When it says an 84 cent uh, right here per thousand dollar AV increase, that's 84 cents more than in, in 2023 than it is in 2022. But it's actually, uh, and it actually is showing an 80 cent per um, thousand dollar decrease from the rates in 2020. So now I'm going to uh, ask uh, one by one our two of our community members, Shelly Henderson, if you could come up and make a few comments. Um, and this is the um, question I'd like you to kind of um, answer for us, please. Hi, thanks for having me here. Um, hopefully this addresses that question. I was part of the group um, that was on this committee. Mike, Darcy, and Jim led our group through another difficult decision-making process. What should be on the 2022 capital levy? The group was provided with comprehensive information of the projects needed at Everett School District. 
many that were familiar to, our, to us and some that were new since the previous bond meetings. It was obvious there was research and thought that went into the projects on the large list we reviewed, including dollars for the Clean Buildings Act upgrades and upcoming unfunded energy mandate. To me, knowing upcoming need is just as important as knowing current needs for a successful levy program. There was an opportunity in meetings to email and ask questions, all of which were addressed quickly and comprehensively. During our meetings, Jim ensured that every person was able to share their thoughts on the projects and, and the levy in general. There was struggle and open discussion to find a balance of supporting critical need and tax rates. There was discussions about what the most critical need is and how that supported equity and access to programs. Ensuring the capital levy will positively impact all areas of our district. How the projects support other decisions by the district, such as high school boundary adjustments. How even with COVID, there are still needs to support existing and growing enrollment. And what projects we thought the community wants and will also support. I think the 2022 levy package addresses the most critical need touches every part of our district and has a wide variety of projects to support our students for several years to come. The group, including myself, support what is in front of you and what's presented to you tonight. Given how close the bond was to passing, I am hopeful that the board and our community will see the value and support this 2022 capital levy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. And now, just, uh, Justin Tidwell, if you could come up and make some comments as well. And we will all be around if you have questions after the presentation. I will not be. I will be running. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, my name is Justin Tidwell. I was part of the Capital Bond Committee. It's my second year. Um, I'm going to retire in this committee. No, I'm kidding. Um, but our committee was presented with a lot of information, and it was, as shall be said, very comprehensive. And um, it could have been overwhelming at first glance. But what Jim Dugan and the leadership team was able to do was to help provide a framework for us to make good decisions. And, you know, a decision can be made, but how do you know if it's good? Well, you need a barometer or something to measure what that decision looks like. And so um, in, we kind of created a team charter and it was developed fairly quickly. Um, we met just a few times. However, many of the members had been in the previous committee as well. So there was a lot of uh, historical knowledge that allowed us to kind of catch up quickly. Um, in my personal words or um, uh, interpretation would be that the, the charter mandated that our decisions would be equitable to our children, families, and stakeholders of our school district, um, that our decisions would prioritize a clean and safe environment, that we would consider the enrollment status of the 2022 school year, maybe even 2023, that we help prioritize a tax neutral position and develop a consensus recommendation for the Everett School District uh, School Board. Um, this charter enabled us to consider the information that was before us and challenge the decisions that we came to um, agree upon. And I think that was important for the group is to understand that, you know, we have this critical amount of information. We have a challenge in front of us that's the 2022 levy. And, you know, how do we know that we've made a good decision? Well, through that charter, this the committee members were able to review those projects and, and come to consensus knowing that we met that charter. So um, because of that, I feel comfortable that the decision making was sound and accurately represented the CBPC's recommendation for 2022 levy. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. All right, um, so just uh, one more slide. Next steps, uh, 
Um, assuming that we get clear uh, guidance from the board for, for the EPNO levy and the capital levy, we plan to bring these back, these resolutions back in two weeks to you for consideration for approval, uh, which would start a uh, fairly quick process for us to advertise and select pro and con committee members for both ballot measures now required uh, for all of these elections. Uh, we would bring back to you on November 30th a, a, um, an agenda item for approval of the selection of those committee members. Um, if we don't go through that process, then the uh, county would go ahead and um, select committee members, by the way. Um, all of the documents, including the resolutions, pro and con committee member selections and other things are due to the county December 10th. And at that point, then uh, the next major milestone would be January 20th ballots mailed out by the county and election day on February 8th. And uh, with that, I conclude my presentation and would be glad to answer questions. Um, and maybe I could just start with the one that was asked prior. Um, I'm just going to fairly um, try to generalize and say that anything that you can spend um, bond monies on, you can spend general fund monies on. So the EPNO levy could go for virtually anything that you put on a bond or a capital levy. Uh, it's uncommon that we would do that because there are a lot of needs on the general fund side. So we try to meet our needs for capital projects with capital levies and bonds. Uh, and you can pretty much spend capital levy monies on most of the things that you can spend bonds monies on. That's why the list of projects from the prior bond is very similar. We started with that as the baseline for the levy discussion. Last, uh, last, I think it was either April or May, I got the chance to tour a couple of those sites um, with the administration and with someone I don't remember his name, but someone who was in charge of like um, organizing the planning. It, it was like an architect kind of person who was it was planning the the buildings. Okay. Um, and the projects, and it, it was just a really cool experience. We got to see um, the two sides of it. We got to tour Jackson Elementary School and see why it needed those renovations. Oh yeah. And also to tour um, Everett High School and the cafeteria and those spaces. Um, and we also got to see the the brand new North Middle School building. Um, so it's cool to see that that experience um, touring those sites is kind of finally coming into something that I can see in, in a policy. So right. thank you. Well, I just thank wanted you. to share that because it's like finally relevant. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Or Mr. Gunn, or I just want to I want to thank the committee members for coming tonight and for helping us with our decision. Yes, I did too. Your, your, your support is outstanding and appreciated. I did too. Want to uh, thank Shelley and Justin and your the total committee for the work that they did. I'm very happy to see that when you start looking at the technology levy, which we know our public is very appreciative of the fact that we went one to one well before the pandemic and we have to maintain keeping up with technology. That technology portion at 96, 96 million, I think it was on your chart, brings our total levy um, proposal well below the $300 million point. It's very close to $229 million, in fact, for the modernization of our school district's facilities. Yes, if you remove the technology from that, yeah. If you remove right. the technology, which is, um, in my opinion, very good. And I thank you very much for that thought. Thank you. Um, and just, Mr. Gunn, could you go back to slide four? Okay. 
And I just, it kind of is in the same vein as my, um, of my colleagues. I just wanted to make sure folks understand that this was like Groundhog's Day for these folks. We worked really hard like, on that original committee. And so when Justin <laughs> says, you know, this will be something he retires in, he's not joking. It was a lot of hard work, a lot of hours the first go round. And so to get the email to say, can you come back and serve again was, was no small ask, especially during a global pandemic. So thank you to not just Shelly and Justin who showed up today, but just to everybody on this list, because these are the folks who said, yep, I'm going to go ahead and do this all again. So thank you for, for highlighting them. I just wanted to make sure their names are all up there, including our district staff, um, who are, I think everybody's in different positions now than when they even originally started. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Director Nichols, did you have any questions? Uh, no, I think it's, um, you know, it's in line with what we talked about. Um, I'll echo my thanks to the board. Um, it's definitely wasn't, as we know from our retreat, it wasn't an easy decision. Um, we know what to keep, what to cut, um, those types of things. So I do appreciate the due diligence that the committee provided. Thank you. Okay, I not seen any further questions or comments. So go ahead and thank you and one more thank you to our committee members. Thank you so much, Shelley and Justin, for being here tonight. Thank you very much. OK, that takes us to our upcoming agenda items. Dr. Salzman. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, board directors, and to the public. Just a point of privilege. Justin, thank you for being here. It's always great seeing your wife in the classroom. She's an amazing teacher. So thank you for allow allowing her to teach with us in Everett. Thank you. <laughs> okay, at the November 9th regular meeting, the board agenda will contain the following, a National Merit Scholar Finalist Recognition, Science 6-8 Chemistry Adoption First Reading, Washington State School Directors General Assembly Debrief, Approval of the Capital Levy, Approval of the Educational Programs and Operational Levy, and the June 1 recovery plan status. Thank you, Madam Chair and Board of Directors. Thank you. Next item of business is executive or closed session, and we do not have either this evening, which takes us to item 17.0, and you all know what that means. We are adjourned. Thank you for being here this evening. <laughs>